good morning everyone and welcome to this uh, webinar about the GDPR held by uh, Base Farm. Um, we are very happy to have you here and we are, um, if you can push the button Patrick, uh, uh, my name is Esten Hohl. I'm uh, heading the quality and security department in Basefarm, and Basefarm being a company present in Norway, Sweden, uh, Holland, and even in Germany and Austria these days after an acquisition this summer. I've been with Basefarm for approximately 12 years, and um, to get, together with me today I have my compliance manager, Patrick Tahiri. Hello, my name is Patrick Tahiri and I'm a compliance manager. And I'm very pleased to be here with you as well. So, um, we will be discussing GDPR uh, this morning. Um, we will be do starting with some um, basic information, some fundamentals, explaining what GDPR actually is. But then we will uh, try to move on to um, uh, more practical um, stuff on how we and how other companies should work uh, to prepare for um, um, May 2018 when um, GDPR uh, starts for real. So, Patrick, should we start then? Um, yes. GDPR, first of all, the abbreviation means General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, it is a new uh, European Union legislation. It is already approved, but uh, it's not coming into full force until May 2018. Then it will effectively replace local legislation in all EU member states, as well as the European economic area states uh, like Norway. And as, uh, as such, it is applicable to any company providing services to uh, European Union residents, meaning that, for instance, also US-based companies like Facebook and Google have to comply. Esten, uh, what is the difference between the current uh, data protection directive and uh, this GDPR uh, regulation? Well, first of all, this is a regulation. Uh, and the previous, previous one was a directive which meant that the different countries could opt in or uh, opt out of different parts of it. GDPR, being a regulation, will be put into force at the same time and contain the same rules in all countries. Different, different countries can't decide how to change their, uh, their own legislation in this area. That being said, there is a list of paragraphs in GDPR where additional safeguards uh, can be made. But GDPR certainly means that the rules will be a lot more similar across all countries. Thank you. Is there significant differences between uh, the current DPD, well, Data Protection Directive, and the GDPR? There are not really huge changes compared to existing legislation in different countries. But uh, above all, the new regulation adds a lot of attention to personal data protection and privacy. And data subjects, uh, and by, by that I mean the individuals who are registered, will, they will, um, through all the talk about GDPR these days, be more aware of their rights. And of course, companies will already have learned that the possible penalties for breaching the reg reg regulation can be really damaging. The penalties actually can be 20 million euros, or 4% of a company's yearly global turnover. And that surely puts GD, GDPR compliance on the radar of CEOs, CFOs, and, uh, and boards of directors. Um, Patrick, uh, maybe it's a good idea for you to walk through some of the main principles and the terms in the new law. Thank you, Esten. As you just heard, uh, the regulation is for the protection of personal data and privacy. With the regulation, I mean the GDPR. Before to start showing you the methodology to implement a privacy program, let me define some key components of the regulation, like processing, personal data, the GDPR, core principles, 
and the right of the individuals. These definitions will help you understand better the methodology presented in this webinar. Processing and personal data. Processing is all operations applied on personal data. Personal data is any data or information that can be used to identify a person. For example, your name, your email, your address, your social number, they are all personal data. Even a video of a crowd where you can be seen is a personal data. Be aware of if different pieces of information combined together can identify a person, it's personal data as well. This means that most organizations highly likely deal with personal data in some levels and that they are under the regulation scope. You may have already heard about a category of personal data called sensitive personal data. This category is specifically defined in the regulation. It's information which could be used to identify, for example, an individual's ethnic origin, physical or mental health, criminal convictions, and political or religious beliefs. Data related to children, genetic and biometric, are also another category of sensitive personal data. I would like to mention that sometimes we will use the term of data subject throughout this presentation. The data subject is someone whose data you have. The key actors. We will talk about them more in depth later in this methodology by explaining their roles. My goal here is only to define them in this introduction. You have the data controller. It's the organization that has a relationship with data subjects and processes their personal data. The controller determines the purposes and means of the personal data processing. You have the data processor. It's a third party organization that works for a data controller and processes personal data on its behalf. For example, an IT service provider like BaseFarm. And you have the data subjects. They are the users, consumers, customers, or employees, for example. Here you are the core principle whenever you are processing personal data. Transparency. It means to the data subjects, I'm having your personal data, and this is what I'm doing with it, the purpose. Purpose limitation. It means to the data subject, I'm processing your personal data only to achieve the purpose we agreed on, and nothing else. So it means it's expected, it is expected by the person whose data is. Minimization. It means to the data subject, I'm using the minimum possible of your personal data to achieve the business or organization needs. Accuracy. It means to the data subject, your personal data shall be accurate and kept up to date. Inaccurate personal data can be erased or rectified without delay. Retention limitation. It means to the data subject, I'm keeping your data as long as necessary for the purposes for which they have been collected. Data security. It means for the data subject, I'm taking appropriate security measures to protect your personal data. Accountability. GDPR introduced an approach of responsabilization for the data controller. It's the accountability principle. Accountability means for the organization managing personal data, I'm legally responsible for the protection of the personal data and for processing them in line with the regulations requirements. The general 
idea is that the data controller is accountable for the regulations obligations and must prove, demonstrate that appropriate technical and organizational measures has been taken to comply with this regulation. It's not the responsibility of the data protection authority, like for example, Data Tilsina in Norway or Data Inspection in Sweden, to prove that an organization has failed to meet its obligations. From an operational perspective, demonstrating accountability is proving an organization has an established, established sorry, privacy program. I mean by that a workable privacy framework for demonstrating accountability. Data subjects have a set of rights under the regulation. It means your customers, users, partners, or consumers, for example, can at any time require, require you to respond to the rights. So prepare your organization, processes, and systems to be able to timely manage requests like the right to be informed about their data, the processing of the data, what's going to be done with the data. The right to access the data and processing history. The right to have incorrect data corrected. The right to have their data deleted. The right to restrict the processing of their data. The right to take their personal data to a different organization the right to postpone or stop processing personal data, the right to object to automated decision making. As you see, depending on the volume of this request you, you might have from your data subjects, you should start design and implement how to automate as much as possible the management of all these requests effectively and timely. In some cases, some organizations or purposes are exempt from these uh, rights and principles. Public authorities, like for, for instance, tax authorities are not allowed to simply delete your data. So most of these rights mainly apply for services you have signed up to and, whether, and where no other law is preventing you from changing your mind. Thank you, Patrick. That was... Um... 10 minutes of GDPR fundamentals. Um, I'm sure most of you listening in already have attended different seminars, breakfast meetings or similar, hearing longer version of what Patrick now, Patrick now has uh, been discussing. Um, but we thought it was uh, good to, to have this uh, sort of as a basis for the rest of this presentation. Given that there only now is less than nine months until we all need to, to be done with our preparations, we think it's about time we get down to practicalities. So the rest of this meeting will hopefully provide you with some clear ideas on what you need to do and how you can do it. And BaseFarm have invented or designed a seven-step roadmap with activities that we need to do ourselves uh, and that we think is applicable for more or less any company. Uh, we will now take you on that journey. He or she uh, must not have other roles where there could be a conflict of interest. The DPO shall basically be looking after the rights of the data subjects and shall have direct access to the company's top management by passing organizational layers if needed. There is actually a degree of job protection in this role as well. You cannot sack the DPO for doing his job, although it may conflict with management or business interest and prioritizations. Esten, uh, does uh, the organization needs, need to hire a new employee for this role? No, it can be combined with other roles. Um, the important thing is that um, the DPO is impartial. Um, note also that the DPO does not have to be employed either. You can hire an external to the role and you can share a DPO with other companies if that is convenient. 
The reason why we suggest this as step one is simply that once the DPO is appointed, he or she can manage or at least actively participate in the rest of the preparation activities. When multiple companies are involved in the same processing, as is the case when you outsource some or all your services to somebody like Base Farm, and the respective DPOs should become familiar with each other and cooperate both before and after May 2018. So, based on this, we think it's a good idea for all companies actually to make sure they appoint someone to this role and let them have the necessary training sooner rather than later. So that's step one, but uh, Patrick, what's next? Next step uh, is then is uh, map your personal data. This means that you shall have control on your data and be able to show it. So what does having control on your personal data mean? It means you must understand the nature of your personal data, categorize them, know where they are in your organization and systems, and how they are used. Note that data can be in unstructured or structured format. The approach would be the same. It means you must register, like an inventory, all the processes operating on your personal data and describe them. Record their purposes or related business needs. Identify who is involved in their processing, the external and internal actors. Design a data flow diagram to get the whole picture. Once you have done the, that inventory, conduct a gap assessment between what you have mapped so far and what you should do regarding the regulations obligations. For example, do you need all given data sets or only some of them to reach your business needs? What is their retention time? Are they sensitive data? How do you collect them? Do you have the consent of your data subjects? How are you processing them? Where are they stored and eventually transferred? I recommend you to clean up obsolete data or data you don't currently need. The best approach to do this would be probably on a service-by-service -service basis. For example, start with, with an HR process and determine how you manage your employee records. If your processing involves service providers like BaseFarm, the data processor, you must involve them. They will contribute with fundamental information and support about the processing and data flow. Next step. Yep. Next step. What's next? The next is to make sure you understand uh, the different roles involved. As you mentioned, Patrick, earlier, uh, GDPR defines two separate roles. Data controller is the entity or the company that determines the purpose and the manner of processing. The data processor is an entity who processes the data on behalf of the data controller. So in, in the world of base arm, that means that most often our customers are data controllers and base farm. Uh, their data processor or one of their data processors. Uh, because sometimes there will be more than one data processor involved as well. Uh, they can obviously be, be managing different parts, different services, and be processors alongside it, each other, or one data processor might be using a sub-data processor. This may sound easy, and sometimes it is. However, sometimes it might be more difficult. Um, our customer may only be a processor themselves and based on their sub-processor. Also, the roles might differ from one service to another. So, like Patrick said uh, on bullet one, again, do this research on one service at a time. If you are using a data processor, find out if they are using sub-processors, and in particular, do they use sub processors outside the EU or the EEA, like a public cloud service provider? 
if this picture is complicated, it might actually be a good idea to involve a lawyer to get it right, because this you need to get right. Esteban, is there any changes in that matter regarding the current uh, data protection directive and the future GDPR? Uh, one of the significant changes in GDPR is that more responsibility is put on the data processors. And probably, probably the biggest change is that GDPR imposes data security requirements directly on processors. Uh, processors are, are liable to fines, to penalties or compensation claims for failure to have sufficient data security. Also, data subjects who think their data is being misused are free to claim compensation from the controller or from the processor. So one can expect that when a small controller company is using a bigger company as their processor, any claims for suspected privacy breaches will be targeted at a bigger company, simply because the compensation potentially then uh, could become bigger. Anyway, you need to figure out the roles of all the involved parties before moving on to the next step. And the next step is perform a DPIA. DPIA means Data Protection Impact Assessment. This is a privacy risk assessment where we evaluate the processing operations in scope with the GDPR principles. We assess the effect of breaches of the confidentiality, integrity, and availability on data subjects' rights and on our ability to be resilient. The DPIA is under the responsibility of the data controller. However, a data processor can also perform a DPAA on behalf of the data controller and should at least be helping the controller. To get the full picture, get the help from your service providers. And when you evaluate the risk to be too high and you want to mitigate it, you are likely to need your service providers involved in that as well. After having an inventory of your processes made in the previous step, you can evaluate which processing operations are likely to result in a high risk to the privacy of your data subjects. A DPIA, it's a tool which allows you to develop systems with adequate protection for personal data and privacy. And by adequate protection, I mean determining appropriate organiza organizational operational and technical measures to protect the personal data. Good. But, Patrick, I don't think that the DPIA is required for all types of processing. Am I right? You, you're right. The DPIA is not always mandatory, and there is a difference about when the DPIA should be career, carried out, and it's prior to the processing and when the DPIA is required. And it's when processing is likely to result in a high risk to the privacy. It shall be carried out prior to processing, which is consistent with the key concepts of privacy by design and privacy by default. And then, what about existing processes? Regarding already existing processing operations, it's recommended to execute, to execute sorry, a DPIA as well. We have developed a, made a method and a template for conducting DPIAs. And yes, we can do DPIAs together with customer if needed. We also use our catalog of uh, best practices to advise and select which measures are appropriate to mitigate the identified risk and implement them. And what about next step, uh, Esten? Next step would be the paperwork. And you need some um, agreements. And this is when you start making real use of the roles you clarified in, in step three. As a data controller, you need to sign data processing agreements with any and with all data processors. These agreements must cover the duration, the nature, and the purpose of the processing, the types of data processed, and it must define all the obligations of the data processor in this respect. 
This is, this is quite similar, of course, to existing practices under the current data protection laws. However, the agreements need to be changed now in order to cover all that is required by GDPR. So even if you have an existing data processing agreement with your processors, it will need to be replaced. Um, Basefarm have been busy preparing a standard uh, template for this. And we would really like most customers to sign our standard agreement, as would I expect other um, processors uh, to do it. As that means we would be in control of the terms in it and the risk involved from our side. But we know from experience that some customers, for different reasons, require us to sign their own DPA. We will, of course, do that, but uh, then we need to uh, go thoroughly through them. Uh, and look for um, uh, differences between um, those uh, agreements and our own uh, standards. And if the obligations are different, we may have to end up in discussions about money, of course. But it's, it's possible. What if the uh, data processor service provider use itself another data processor? Yeah, if, if a data processor is using a sub-processor, um, similar sub-data processing agreements must be signed. And, by the way, uh, GDPR will actually prevent a data processor to start using a sub-processor without the written consent of the data controller. If the data processor, or a sub-processor for that matter, is located outside the EU, um, there is more paperwork needed. In fact, even if the actual processing of, of data m might happen inside the EU, if, if the systems and the data can be accessed from anyone outside the EU, the same rules apply. So, when a public cloud provider promises you that the data will never leave the EU, Ask them how they make sure that, that the data cannot be accessed from their employees or their partners outside the EU. Some words about privacy shield and uh, other arrangements uh, that you may need. Um, if the data processor is located in the US, uh, they first of all need to have a privacy shield certification. That makes transfer of personal data at all possible. However, in addition, you still need a data processing agreement with these processors. And this is important, and it's something not all the cloud providers yet have realized. Privacy Shield makes the data transfer to a US-based cloud provider possible, but to comply with GDPR, you also need a data processing agreement that regulates the actual data processing with the same cloud provider. Okay, Esten, uh, are these cloud providers fully aware of, of this? Well, some cloud providers have prepared for this or are in the process of doing it now. After all, their business in Europe are at risk if they don't. But unfortunately, others have not yet fully understood what they need to do. So when you are starting to use public cloud services today and want to make sure it is GDPR compliant, you may be at least one step ahead of the cloud providers. Esten, uh, can we have more complex organization structure involved in uh, processing operation? Oh, sure. If the data processor resides neither in the EU nor the US, or if it operates both inside and outside the, the European Union, things start to get really complicated. There are other tools available for non-US or EU-based processors, one of which is called the model agreements, and these contain standard data protection clauses, and they will be approved either by the EU or a national data protection authority somewhere. Only a data controller can enter into a model agreement. Another tool is the so-called binding corporate rules. However, that is something only the really, really big companies will be able to use. Um, I guess you probably we are a bit confused at this point. Um, Basefarm is not in the business of offering legal advice. Uh, so our tip of the day has to be get your lawyer involved in defining the legal agreements you need and probably get them to help you draft these agreements as well. 
Yeah. Patrick, what's next? Yes. Thank you, Western. Next is a uh, next step is service design. The regulation specifically requires that systems used to process personal data satisfy two key concepts: privacy by design and privacy by default. This means that privacy must be built into your systems and that the strictest available privacy setting must be default. Baseform will use this principle when engaging with customers in designing platforms and infrastructures. For customer facing application, these concepts and the concern from data subject must be a design criteria for your software development management. The regulation contains a set of, the, of data subject rights I have described, described earlier in this webinar. Remember, your users, consumers, or customers, for example, can exercise their rights at any time, and your application and processes should be able to fulfill their requests timely and for free. Make sure to have software development policies in line with these obligations and that your application will be changed accordingly before May next year. It might, be, it might not be possible to implement all on your own or in time before May. Involve your service providers to discuss your options and maybe your lawyers to check optimal alternatives. The service providers also need to raise their security. They have an obligation to provide a sufficient level of information security. There are different ways of ensuring that, for, inst for instance, through certifications or third-party auditing. As a data, data controller, you must also make sure that you will be able to detect and manage privacy breaches, work out your requirements for security monitoring, and make sure your service providers know what you need from them. What's next, uh, Esten? Next step. Next step, please. Yes. Um, the rights of the data subjects must be supported by the data controller. And usually, you can only support that by a combination of technology, as discussed in the previous step, uh, and some routines that go uh, along with it. So. When the system support have been developed, it's time to develop and document your operational processes and routines that should be used for things like uh, collecting user consent, providing users with information of your data processing, personal data deletion or transfer, withdrawal of consent, and subsequent limited processing, and so forth. Data controllers and processors need to agree how they cooperate to perform these routines. And the same goes for uh, arguably the most important GDPR routine of uh, them all, the data breach notification routine. GDPR states that the data controller must report a privacy breach if it occurred within 72 hours after detection. If the actual detection is made by by your processor, who in turn then will notify the controller. This, of course, needs to happen even sooner than that. So these routines must be developed, documented, and tested by the parties. So how, how should a person data breach be approached, Esten? Well, an important part of breach notification, or actually a prerequisite, is the ability to detect the breach, and typically you need some form of monitoring to achieve that. It may sound convenient, of course, to not set up monitoring, as you then probably will ne never notice a privacy breach, meaning you cannot report it, and subsequently your risk for penalties are reduced. However, this approach is clearly the most risky one. The more time you spend on detecting a privacy breach, the bigger the impact probably will be. More users may have been compromised uh, for a longer period of time, etc. So, uh, and if you then 
are subjected to investigations at some point, then it becomes evident that you decided against investing in, the, in detection capabilities. I'm afraid you're not likely to be treated mildly by the authorities. And of course, the effort and the cost for privacy monitoring, as any other feature in your service, must be balanced against your risk exposure and your risk appetite. And sufficient detection capabilities can be achieved in a number of different ways. Buying security monitoring from somebody like Basefarm is, uh, of course, only one of them. Okay, yes, then. Uh, have we done uh, everything then? Well, Yes, we said seven steps, didn't we? Yet, here is uh, step number eight. This is, however, simply a reminder that uh, everything you consider, everything you decide, or everything you do in either of the above steps must be documented and saved. Sooner or later you will be audited, or you may be targeted by users or even groups of users claiming that you are in breach of GDPR <clears throat> risking heavy fines. That, that's when you need to prove your efforts. Anyone that tried their best to prepare and can prove what they did will have significantly less financial risk, even if an, if an uh, authoritative body might judge that you made some wrong assumptions along the way. Remember that GDPR is fresh from the press, so to speak, and that national data protection authorities will have to come up with guidelines and interpretations and that the EU will have to agree on the practicalities going forward. In May 2018, we therefore are all more or less expected to, to comply to something that still may lack clarifications in some areas. And we think that proving that you did your best is the best you can do at this point. And the proof is in the pudding. In this case, your documented considerations and your documented decisions. Yeah, fine. During this presentation so far, we have touched on a number of areas where you, if you are a data controller, uh, need help from your data processor. So Patrick, maybe you can try to summarize that. Uh, I mean, where, when Basefarm is your processor, for instance, how can we be helping our customers? Yes, uh, well, what, what can we offer? Basefarm has an extensive experience in data protection. Our service offering is already compliant with the current uh, personal data leg legislation in the countries where we are in, which gives us a good platform even for GDPR. We operate IT systems with cardholder data, which are regulated under the strictest security standard regarding data protection, namely the payment card industry data security standard. This standard defines specific organizational and technical measures which ensure data security for cardholder data payment transactions. So this base rounds experience, know-how, mindset, and technological platform ensure that information security is taken care of in the deliveries to our customers. So they, in turn, can meet their GDPR requirements. The security solutions and program programs we have cover network and system security, encryption, vulnerability management, change management, access management, monitoring and testing. My colleagues working in the customer teams together with our data protection officer and security consulting group can assist you for that. For example, they can advise and support you to implement a GDPR compliant privacy program. Map your personal data and processing operations in our inventory templates. Perform DPIAs based on our methodology. Customize data processor agreements. Design solutions and operational processes. Before finishing, uh, remember to update your current data processor agreements with your actual service providers. 
And uh, if you want to know more or simply want to get started, you're welcome to contact our de your dedicated uh, BaseFarm customer team and, and our DPO. They will be pleased to advise you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. That was um, the end of the slideshow and the presentation that we have prepared. Uh, so we have some time now for uh, questions. And I've been trying to keep an eye on uh, questions uh, popping in. Okay. Uh, if there's anyone listening that would like some to, to raise a question, then please use uh, um, the, the function in the, in the software you're currently in. Uh, but we have some, so let me have a look, Patrick. You okay. might be able to answer some of them. Yeah. There's a question here. Uh, that says, we are a rather small company, but handling rather big data sets. I understand that there is a GDPR light for small companies uh, regarding the DPOs, etc. And we mentioned that the DPO role as such uh, is not mandatory for small businesses. Um, so if you, but, but this small company apparently handles a lot of personal data which means you're uh, on the border of uh, needing to have one anyway and our advice is to even though you don't actually appoint somebody with that title make sure you understand and the, the people in your organization understand who's actually in charge of personal data protection in your company and who's doing Who's, who's looking after these things see, as, um, uh, on behalf of the data subjects, those being registered? Do you have anything to add to that, Patrick? Yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm agree. And uh, I think that really, as, as we um, as we described in the beginning of this presentation, uh, it's uh, and apparently they have. It's really to 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 know what. Uh, what to be in control and to know what, what kind of data they have and where, where, where they have this data to classify, categorize them. And um, I, I don't know if they have, they do have a service provider involved in that. Uh, if, if they have to, uh, to get help from them. And if, if they're in doubt, they can ask them or they, even better, if they, or to complete that, they can ask directly the data protection, uh, the local data protection uh, authority, for example, Norway Data TC, you know, if they are in doubt, for example. So there is no uh, GDPR light or uh, or uh, not light. It's uh, it's knowing what they have, the risk regarding what they have as a uh, personal data, and uh, re regarding. The, and the, when I, t I took the risk, it's between this data and what 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 are the requirements in the, the GDPR, and and decide what kind of measures uh, they have to implement to to respond to this requirement, GDPR requirements. So that they can, it can be a big com big company having a small amount of data, and uh, and it can be uh, a very heavy GDPR requirements uh, according to the organization, for example, and it can be. A, uh, it can be a small company having uh, having a lot of data. It it really depends uh, of the nature of the data. Yeah, thanks. Um, any question that comes in, by the way, we we will do our best to answer those um, after the meeting as well. But uh, we'll pick uh, some others uh, now. Um, this is a question again for you, Patrick. Uh, could a software supplier be considered a data processor uh, if they only supply the software? Uh, I, on the fly uh, right now, I don't think so. No. Uh, to be a data processor, you actually must have uh, the, the, the access to, to the data. So providing software uh, does not mean that you're a data processor. Um, what else do we got here? Uh, how does these regulations affect anonymized or semi-anonymized data sets, for example, used for an analysis purposes? Can we say anything about that, Patrick? 
if it's a one-way encryption, you, you are out of scope of the GDPR. This is what I uh, can say. So if you anonymize your data, strictly anonymize your data, you are out, they are out of scope. It's not considered as personal data. But if you, if you are pseudonymizing your data, if you are tokenizing your data, it means that you are indexing your data some, somehow with, a, with another value. These, these are still considered as personal data because they, the, those uh, pseudonymized data can be recovered somehow with a key, for example. Yeah, good. Another question uh, here is, uh, how do you suggest we handle unstructured information such as emails, file shares, SharePoints, OneDrives, or what have you? Uh, I can try to answer that one. Um, the main thing, I think, is to identify any data islands you might have that keeps uh, unstructured uh, personal data. You have to identify them much the same way you, you do with your structured data sources. And you need to handle them much the same way as you treat your structured data. Um, so identify the systems that keep these unstructured data as part of your personal data mapping activity. And make sure that uh, you apply proper access manage management to it so, so that it can only be accessed by those that actually have a business need to access it. Then you should probably consider um, pseudonymizing the data through, for instance, uh, encryption of the data at rest. And if you need to be able to uh, quickly uh, find data in such a data lake, you, you probably would be looking at investing in some big data or some search tools that can be used to index and search for specific um, personal data in, in these uh, systems. Anything to add, Patrick, to that? Yeah, no, it's... Um... I'm, I'm agree, I mean, uh, I'm just thinking again that everything starts with mapping, uh, mapping what you have and where, where it is. And starting from there, it depends. Then choosing which uh, strategy and measure we, we shall implement to, to get more control or uh, take mitigation initiative to, to, to have control and to securize this data. Mm. This is an interesting question, I think. I'm not sure if we know the answer, but uh, let's have a go. Does GDPR apply if data is only stored for a limited time period, say one to seven days? Um, yes, I would say yes. Uh, so long that you have, from the moment you have personal data in your systems, then you are, you are, you are responsible of this data. So, and when, the, when they're not anymore, then, then you are not anymore. This is what I, I'm thinking about. I agree. Uh, by the way, uh, you, you always have to have a retention time uh, regarding the purpose. So, it can be seven days or three years, you are under the scope of GDPR. Yeah. Here's another one. Um, Will a technical consulting service provider with access to an on-premise ERP installation be considered a data processor? And I think the key here is access to the ERP system, yeah, which means then, yes, that company is a, um, a data processor, and yes, you need to uh, make sure that uh, you sign a data processing agreement mm -hmm. with this company. So, um, two seconds, I'll see if there's any more interesting questions here. Okay, we'll try this one. Hi, we are a software developer and provide a service to companies that sells a service and base farm are responsible for the infrastructure. Are are we, as a service provider, responsible for GDPR? I'm not sure if I understood that perfectly. We, uh, the software developers, they provide services to 
a company and uh, base farm is um, managing uh, or the operating the services afterwards are they then um, a, um, a data processor the, the developing company I'm just uh, based on that uh, based on that I'm just thinking that base farm is a they are a service provider and base farm we are a service provider as well and we are a service provider on the infrastructure platform side. There are software developer and as a service provider. Um, if they're only developing the software, uh, I don't think they are under the scope of GDPR. No, they, but, they, but there there are some interesting things around uh, test data or data extracted and used for test purposes, right? That's, that's correct. So if, if you ever get um, a dump from the, the production database containing personal information and use that internally during your software development process, then you, you are actually accessing personal data and then, then you're a data processor unless the data has been completely anonymized. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, it's an inter this is an interesting discussion, but I'm, I'm just thinking at who is uh, who is granting these accesses. Uh, th there are only a software developer, or not only, but uh, there there are strictly a software developer uh, supplier. Who is uh, giving them the accesses to this, this person's data? I think this is important to think about. The, 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 what is central here is the user access management. And this this is not done by this uh, software company. It's surely it's surely done through the, the data controller, our common customer, and uh, base farm. So this is what I'm thinking in this configuration. So if uh, if there's if they have access, if they have been granted the accesses to personal data. They have surely a responsibility uh, to not copy this data uh, at their sites, for example. Yes, in that way, yes, they, are, they, are, they can be responsible. Thank you. Um, we're um, approaching the, the end of this hour. Uh, there's a few that have been asking us if um, the presentation will be uh, emailed through to the participants. And I guess the, the answer to that is yes, we can do that. Then I think we have time for one more uh, question, and this is uh, also an interesting question. Um, how is the right to be forgotten handled for backups? Um, uh, and that that is the trick question, because I don't think that um, the guys in EU that uh, wrote this um, um, directive have been thinking into those details. And we have been discussing that particular um, question with our lawyer for some time. And what we think currently is that um, um, backup technologies uh, do not actually allow us to um, delete unique records uh, in any practical way. So. It is likely we think that uh, this is um, uh, an area uh, where there will be sort of uh, exempts from uh, from the right to be forgotten clauses. The, the, the most important thing is that uh, the right to be forgotten, it's at least online. You, you, it's something to be on tape, but, uh, to have uh, our data, data on, on tape somewhere stored and uh, having our data online uh, directly accessible from the internet. So the right to be forgotten, at least from online, from directly access from the internet, for example. This is, this is the major uh, thing about uh, the right to be forgotten. If we, if we manage to show that uh, the, 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 the accessibility to the tape is, sec is secured in some way, then, uh, then we might be exempt of uh, of the of this requirement, or or we let's put it that simpler. We are we are fulfilling the GDPR requirement if we can show that uh, nothing online can be accessed. 
and the, GD and the tapes are securely stored somewhere without uh, with li very limited accesses. Okay, thank you. Um, that was uh, one hour. I hope that you all uh, learned something. Uh, I'm sure there's more questions that we may or may not be able to answer. We'll uh, try to follow up every question that uh, came in that we didn't uh, already uh, reply to. Um, and we will uh, make sure that you get the presentation. You will also uh, be able to um, um, to see this because we're taping uh, the whole webinar and it's uh, to be published on the Base Farm uh, website uh, within a few days. So um, thank you all for attending. Have a nice weekend and um, make sure you um, spend some time on uh, preparing for GDPR. There is less than nine months, so uh, we better get to it. Thank you. Thank you.